Testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Harris. I'm a software developer at National Instruments, or simply NI as, as we're now called. Uh, I work on embedded Linux firmware for uh, various uh, industrial products at NI. Uh, and today I want to talk about TPM chips, a uh, fairly common peripheral found on many computers these days and uh, some of the benefits and problems of using it to improve uh, security on Linux systems, uh, which is something that we've recently experimented with uh, for some of our more security-minded customers. So a disclaimer, uh, I'm not a security researcher. Uh, neither I nor NI are part of the TCG, nor are we a TPM vendor. Um, I'm coming to you today as a user of the technology to uh, share some of the capabilities and problems uh, that we've explored, and I, I hope you find this uh, useful in, in your work. So TPM stands for Trusted Platform Module, uh, sometimes called the security chip or a crypto chip. Um, it is a kind of hardware security module somewhere uh, uh, on your board or inside your CPU. Uh, they're sometimes confused with crypto accelerators, a, a different kind of uh, hardware security module. Um, I can tell you these chips uh, generally accelerate nothing. Uh, they're usually uh, fairly slow devices. Um, they come in uh, various flavors. Uh, so the, the chip variant, sometimes called a discrete TPM, is a, an independent peripheral connected via LPC or sometimes via SPI or I2C uh, to your CPU. Uh, sometimes they're soldered onto your board. Sometimes they're little removable modules plugged in somewhere. Um, more common these days, though, uh, especially on consumer hardware, is some kind of firmware TPM, uh, like Intel's PTT, which, which runs on top of their management engine, or AMD's TPM application on their secure technology system. Um, there are also a variety of user mode simulators out there which can be used in VMs or for prototype and test applications. So TPM is primarily a key manager. Uh, it can hide secrets, uh, sometimes called protected objects, uh, and use them conditionally based on some authorization policy defined at creation. So these authorizations can be uh, simple passwords supplied with, with a command or, or one of many other complicated schemes defined by the object's creator. Uh, the other major function uh, is a kind of logging capability. So, so TPM can track hashes of running binaries and other system configuration contributed by the software running on the CPU. Um, and so this state can be used as one of those authorizations for, uh, for a protected object. So for example, you can create a, a key uh, that can only be used or retrieved from the TPM if the system is in a certain predefined state. Um, and, and this can be done in addition to other authorization constraints like a password. So these two functions are primarily what we're going to be exploring today, um, and, and they enable a kind of secure boot mechanism for the OS and can also extend to user mode applications for, for key management functions uh, to, to some degree. Now, the uh, uh, scribing functionality can, can also extend to external actors. Um, so for example, a TPM can produce a, a, a signed attestation object uh, to, to prove the state of the local system to some, so some external actor, like, like, like a network system, for example. Um, this has some interesting dynamics. So it can be used, for example, as part of an intrusion detection system or, or some kind of state auditing system or a credentialing mechanism, right, to bind a user credential to a specific machine. Um, it can also do some bad things, too, like it can be incorporated into DRM schemes uh, to deny users access to services when they try to run modified software um, on, on their systems. Um, security technology often cuts both ways. Uh, it can help users or it can harm them. Um, and, and my hope is you'll appreciate some of the benefits of the technology today. So we'll be focusing more on the, uh, on the local use cases uh, to protect the local data on, on systems uh, today. Beyond that, uh, it's just a slow crypto engine um, with some persistent storage for internal use that's also forwarded to the user. Uh, and a random number generator for, for generating keys independently of the CPU. Um, now, this is also a good point to bring up the differences between TPM1 and TPM2. So TPMs have been around for a while. Um, TPM2 was introduced uh, 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 a few years ago, and it's a large rework of the wire protocol uh, to communicate with the chip. Um, so, so these changes were, were introduced primarily to modernize the crypto offered by the chips themselves. Um, so TPM1, for example, required uh, SHA-1 hash and, and RSA-28 for, for authentication operations and, 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 and HMAC operations. 
Um, and so TPM2 uh, uh, increased that to SHA-256 and later to 384 and added a couple elliptic curves. Uh, but more significantly, TPM2 also made the crypto engine uh, much more flexible now. So uh, the individual vendors of the chip can add other algorithms as the, 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 the uh, default ones age or become otherwise untrusted. Uh, but in the process, much of the API has also changed. And this is what's most significant to software developers uh, b besides the crypto offering uh, because it, it necessitates a different software stack uh, to drive one chip type versus the other. So the TPM software stack, usually called the TSS for short, uh, is specified by the Trusted Computing Group, or TCG, um, uh, which is a coalition of manufacturers and, and software vendors that define the behaviors of these chips. Uh, you'll find that they also love their uh, acronym jargon, so some confusion is natural here, uh, but I'll hopefully try to demystify some of that today. Um, in a nutshell, the TSS is a collection of C APIs for interacting with the TPM. Uh, and it exists largely because a correct use of TPM, which makes you know some security guarantees, uh, usually involves complex message formatting and validation on the CPU side. Uh, so, so it's more involved than a simple command response device. Uh, and TSS tries to abstract away some of this complexity. So the API is layered into different uh, OS abstractions. Uh, so the feature and enhanced system APIs provide nice things like heap allocated objects, file-based handle storage, like for PCR policies or key handles or what have you. Uh, they can bind to a crypto library on the CPU side uh, for computing you know, HMACs or, or doing uh, parameter encryption. Uh, they're basically kind of nice, easy-to-use application interfaces built on top of a libc. The system API provides more primitive message formatting uh, operations, so there's no heap, no file I.O. or crypto libraries. You sort of bring all of that yourself, and it's, it's more amenable to embedding. Now, in, in user mode, the, the, the system API and then the ones above it are built on top of the TPM command transmission interface, or, or TCTI for short, uh, which is this communication layer uh, for targeting different TPMs on your system. So they can, for example, talk to a local broker service um, or via network socket to a process on your system or even a remote system uh, uh, to, 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 to talk to like a remote TPM chip. Um, Locally, though, there's usually going to be a resource manager, which sort of marshals the commands and responses from different tasks uh, to the actual hardware. Um, so in, in Linux 4.12 and higher, this is the TPM RM0 device uh, that, that the, the TCTI will talk to by, by default. Um, otherwise, on, on older Linuxes, you can talk directly to TPM0. Uh, and if you're using an you know, older version of the chip, you can also set up a broker service, uh, a, a daemon, and talk to it uh, over a domain socket. Um, there are a variety of TSS implementations to choose from, uh, from various software vendors like IBM and Microsoft, Intel, Google, and, and, and others. Um, I'll be using the first one today, the TPM2 software, uh, in my examples, um, mostly because it provides a relatively nice uh, CLI interface from Bash. Uh, if you have a TPM1 in your box, which are still around on many systems, uh, you'll need the old trousers TSS instead. So the tools in this case will be different, but the concepts you see here are generally the same. So you can largely remap the workflows uh, uh, I'll be sharing today in the other tool. Uh, uh, another good uh, application to have is a simulator like SWTPM. Um, so this one in particular is compatible with QEMU, uh, and it's great for, for prototyping uh, on, on a VM. You can also run it standalone uh, and, and, and talk to it over a socket. So now that we've kind of looked at a high-level uh, view of the, the hardware and the driver stacks, I want to use the rest of the presentation to explore a, a few interesting use cases to kind of illustrate what can be done with, uh, with all of this. So one popular application of TPMs is measured boot. Uh, this can be used in conjunction with block or file system encryption to realize a kind of secure boot scheme, which can obfuscate data when something in the system's boot path is altered. So this is sometimes conflated with UEFI secure boot, uh, which can be incorporated into this scheme, but is somewhat orthogonal. Um, UEFI secure boot is a bootloader signing mechanism that checks the signature of the bootloader file, that the EFI program, uh, that's that's run uh, against some certificate database uh, in the firmware uh, before letting it continue. Uh, 
Um, boot measurements, on the other hand, are, uh, are a more passive mechanism. They leverage the scribing functionality of the TPM uh, to track changes as the system boots up and then defer enforcement to the operating system or the user, uh, which makes it a little more flexible. So for Windows users, this is what, uh, if you're familiar with BitLocker's passwordless disencryption, this is what it's, it's based on. And you can do the same thing in Linux as well, uh, which is what, what we'll explore here. So that scribing functionality is realized by platform configuration registers, or, or PCRs for short, uh, which are a collection of hash banks in the TPM. So each bank is a checksum of some subset of software uh, and configuration running on your box. Uh, so on the right is kind of a suggested breakdown from the TCG spec, uh, and they typically alternate between code and configuration. So PCR0 contains the EFI firmware binaries, PCR1 is the firmware configuration, right, the, the hardware configuration that you're booting into. Uh, PCR2 is the option ROM code and the option ROM config and then the EFI bootloader binary and then the partition table that it came from and so on and so forth. Uh, past PCR7 is, is operating system specific so it's based on what's installed on your system. Um, so in this example uh, we're using Grub, uh, a modified version of Grub that measures the running commands into PCR8 and uh, hash, hashes all the files that it reads into PCR9. And the PCR11 is, is used by our init system. Uh, and I don't recall why we skipped PCR10, uh, but we did. So all of these measurements are made by the CPU, uh, by whatever software is running on it. Uh, and the idea is that each program can measure the, the next thing to run before it yields control over. Um, and then if everything is measured, uh, uh, a, a change can then be observed later on uh, in, the, uh, 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 in the boot flow uh, to enforce something. Um, so this model relies heavily on the irrevocability of hashes, of, of these PCR hashes. So the first 16 banks uh, uh, can, uh, uh, can only be uh, extended. They are rolling hashes, right? So the, the, the CPU can only... Uh, add a uh, concatenate new data to the existing hash and update the PCR uh, as a kind of an atomic operation. And they can't reset it. It, it only resets to zero on startup. And so these, these first 16 PCRs measure what's sometimes called the static chain of trust, the, the, the chain of software involved in uh, system bring up. Uh, the registers uh, above that, 17 to 22, are, are wholly managed by the operating system or, or the hypervisor uh, on, the, on, on the CPU. Um, and so these, these measures what's sometimes called the dynamic chain of trust, which can go into, uh, uh, into different processes or different VMs. And so these, these banks are resettable on a context switch, for example, um, and can extend a single, TPM, a single TPM's you know, functions deeper into the software stack, like deeper into user mode applications. So most uh, UEFI firmwares will automatically make these static measurements throughout no the normal course of booting. Um, so uh, at early boot, the, the pre-EFI phase will initialize the TPMs uh, 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 with, with zero PCR values, followed by measurements of, of all the loaded software, like you know, drivers or option ROMs and the installed bootloader. And then uh, from there, the, the bootloader can measure the kernel, the init system, other configuration files involved in boot, uh, so on and so forth. You can continue this um, indefinitely. Um, up until some point where there's an enforcement action, where uh, the the software, which you know, hopefully has been measured at, at this point, um, uh, requests some secret to be released from the TPM uh, to continue booting. Uh, so, for example, this can be the release of a key for an encrypted file system. And, and at this point, you, you can do you know just CPU side file system in, in encryption um, uh, uh, into that partition. So this depicts kind of a software only approach to to hold disk encryption. Uh, another popular uh, approach is, is the use of self-encrypting drives, which are uh, uh, governed uh, largely by the TCG's uh, OPAL standard. Um, so this is where the key is released to uh, a drive's firmware. Um, and so in, in this kind of system, you can, you, know, you can transparently encrypt and decrypt the entire disk independent of the OS, uh, so long as your firmware you know, can kno knows how to drive it correctly. But it largely works the same way. Um, I don't personally use them. Um, I, I, I can see where it's appealing on systems with, with slower CPUs, but uh, you know, I found that the software encryption is usually pretty good and, and, and pretty fast. Now, the security guarantees of PCRs largely hinge on where they're initialized, uh, because from a zero value, you can mimic any PCR state and therefore authorize 
uh, any action that is just solely based on PCR values, right? Uh, so this makes the security, uh, th this makes the uh, very early phases of UEFI boot, the, the so-called security and pre-EFI phases, very critical. Um, ideally, you know, you want this code to run from ROM or otherwise be very difficult to change without, you know, intrusive physical access to the system. Uh, and and how, how secure this is is really up to your hardware vendor. Um, this also means that plugging a TPM into a system whose firmware doesn't understand uh, doesn't understand it uh, can't really do this kind of secure boot. Um, so, for example, uh, putting a, you know, using the TPM add-on board for Raspberry Pis uh, is, is not really going to get you that much uh, boot security uh, uh, like this anyway. Um, so, PCRs are only as trustworthy as the you know, code initializing the TPM itself. And there have been, you know, security challenges in this area in the past, and there are still some today. Um, and, and we will uh, definitely look at this a little bit later on in the presentation. But for now, let's stay in our uh, idealistic world for a moment and just look at an example of this simple key management scheme with TPM tools. So in the first block, we'll set up our TPM by creating a primary key. Uh, so this is a TPM resident object used to protect other secrets later on, like our, our, our disk key. So that second command, uh, evict control, will persist this key into TPM's uh, NVRAM. Um, so persisting is, is totally optional. This is merely done for performance. Uh, the TPM's uh, derive primaries deterministically from a fixed seed random number generator uh, and a combination of, of that and, and the parameters passed to the create function. So multiple runs of the same create will yield the same key. So you can basically remake it after boot. Um, and this also uh, allows you to make more primaries than you can store necessarily in, in NVRAM at, at, at any one time. So you can sort of make a key and use it and, 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 and flush it out. So the, the RNG seed uh, is referenced by that hierarchy parameter in the, in the create primary command. Uh, so we're creating this one under the owner hierarchy, which is what the, the, the you know, equals O stands for. Um, and this is for the, for the operator of the system. Um, so that seed will remain constant so long as the owner doesn't reset the hierarchy, at which point it randomly changes, invalidating all of the objects underneath it. Uh, this is sometimes called taking ownership of the TPM or taking ownership of the hierarchy. Um, and there are several hierarchies in the TPM that kind of operate independently of each other for different uh, uh, slices of the system. Uh, and you can read about these in the, in the TCG spec. Uh, in these examples, we'll just use the owner hierarchy. So in the next block, we'll generate a secret. Uh, hopefully, you'll use something a little better than that, but uh, uh, we'll go with it for now. Um, and then we'll seal it under our primary key and authorize it by the UEFI firmware binaries, uh, so PCR 0, 2, and 4. Um, so sealing here just means encrypting the, the, the key, the, the private data, and a hash of the PCR values uh, by the primary that we just made. And, and the result of this is a set of data blobs that we need to stash somewhere for use on, on next boot. So uh, 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 SPUB contains the metadata about the sealed object, and SPRIV is the actual uh, encrypted key. Um, and so after boot, we can reverse this process by loading that object back into the TPM and then running the unseal function, which will check the policy, and if everything, uh, if everything uh, you know, matches, the TPM will release the key back to you. Now, uh, I'm showing you the TPM commands in this example to illustrate to, to illustrate some of the chips operations, but there are better ways to do this now. Um, so Linux is, uh, Linux's key manager um, has these uh, trusted key uh, types, uh, which can uh, basically do exactly this kind of uh, uh, object sealing uh, on your behalf in the kernel, uh, and that code will probably age better than than anything you 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 homebrew. Now, software updates are generally considered good good practice too, for security and reasons and, and other reasons. Um, and you'll find this scheme works really well until something changes. Um, so supporting updates usually necessitates some kind of resealing operation to to accommodate changes. Um, and there are various strategies to to go about this. Um, so one solution is, is to do just simple offline backups of the raw key and then manually reseal when when uh, uh, changes are or when changes happen on the system. Um, this works really well on personal systems where, you know, where there's a user involved, like, like a laptop. Uh, this is also just generally a good idea because if, if, if the software changes in a way that you can't restore it back, uh, then you really have no way of extracting the key from the TPM. So this is just generally good practice. Um, for headless systems, though, you have to get a little crafty. Uh, and so we've experimented with a few schemes uh, at, at NI. Uh, so, so one is uh, this kind of boot time resealing where the plain key is 
temporarily unsealed into TPM's NVRAM after a successful update operation. And then the init system reseals it next boot to new PCR values. Um, and, and this can be integrated nicely into a package manager for various kinds of uh, you know, uh, kernel or firmware updates on, on the system. Uh, but the downside is it obviously creates a momentary lapse in the key confidentiality across one boot. Uh, the good thing is the user can know about it, uh, and, and it can probably do that safely, hopefully can do that safely. Um, and it's fairly easy to implement and generically applies across many different systems. Uh, but a far better way of doing it is to pre-compute PCRs and reseal to future values uh, on an update. So the, the, the create policy tool uh, can actually accept arbitrary PCR values. Um, uh, and, and so you can sort of seal to, you know, seal to the next state before you actually enter it. Uh, and this can be tricky for, for different reasons, uh, particularly if you have many different hardware models to deal with, with you know, model-specific firmware, or if the user can customize different software on the system. Um, it can kind of lead to a you know, combinatorial explosion. Uh, not to mention that if you compute the wrong values and you have no way of restoring the old ones, uh, you know, obviously it leads to some, some, some problems. Now, user applications can also use the TPM to manage uh, their, their, their keys uh, beyond initial boot. So I'm going to explore some of that in, in, in this section. So uh, user applications are typically built on software crypto systems like OpenSSL, which usually don't know anything about TPMs. Uh, but there are some clever ways around this. So, so this is where PKCS 11's uh, crypto token interface, or uh, uh, Cryptoki, if I'm pronouncing that right, can can help. Uh, so this is a relatively standard interface uh, to removable hardware security modules like smart cards, where, where it originated, uh, or the more modern flavors like like the USB UB key. Uh, so, so TPM are not generally removable, but they're largely similar in terms of functions. They're also a kind of crypto coprocessor plugged into the computer, right? Um, and the really nice thing about PKCS11 is its API is more widely adopted than the TSS, which can bridge you know, TPM functions into other crypto libraries, which can then in turn be bridged into applications. And so the, the TPM2 uh, PKCS11 project implements this kind of Cryptoki API using the TPM as, as the backing token. So continuing our example from before, let's, let's see how to set up this, this library for our TPM chip. So the, the, the uh, uh, PKCS11 API is rooted in the smart card world, which exposes this notion of tokens and slots to the, to the caller. Uh, so a token is a crypto device uh, that is plugged into a slot. So like a smart card reader plugged in, or a smart card plugged into a smart card reader. Uh, and so you know, these APIs are kind of slightly funged to accommodate TPMs. So, uh, so this example is basically constructing that, uh, that adaptation layer. So the first block uses ptool to create a, a, a virtual slot. So this is simply a mapping of slot ID 1 to a persistent TPM primary key. Uh, and we get that, uh, that, that persistent handle from the previous example. Right? Um, the next thing we do is we create a token, which, uh, uh, which in our TPM world is, is just a, a sealed random number, and so the user will, need, will, uh, which will be used to authorize uh, uh, the, the key that we're about to create. And so th this token is really a kind of key ring, right? The user has to unlock the token first and then use that, uh, use its value to authorize the, the use of actual keys. Um, and so th you know, this, this sort of simulates, you know, plugging a, 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 a slot into your computer and then plugging in a token into the slot, if you will. And then finally, the, the last block, we create a key pair from our token on or on our, on our, on our virtual token. Uh, and so this will be a TPM resident key capable of encrypt decrypt functions through the chip. And so once we do all of this, we can now treat the TPM like a smart card. Um, and from this point on, we have uh, many options. Uh, but for this example, let's use OpenSSL. So the uh, Open Smart Card project provides a, the uh, libp11 library, which is an, an, an open SSL engine for smart cards, for PKCS11 style smart cards. Um, and so we can do something like create an X509 cert and load it into Apache or some other application. Uh, so so we'll, 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 we'll call open SSL request uh, to generate a self-signed X509 certificate and, and we use that uh, uh, engine parameter to direct it to the PKCS11 engine. Um, uh, and then this, this, will, this will use the private key referenced by that URL uh, to create a, a self-signed cert and it'll prompt you for a bunch of different parameters too. Uh, 
And then we can configure Apache uh, to use it. So we point the public cert to this new file, and then again, reuse the same uh, PKCS11 uh, uh, key file uh, URL to redirect Apache to the TPM as well. Uh, and for convenience, you can also add the certificate file into the token and just reference both using the same URL. Now, uh, why, why do this? Uh, aside from creating a, a slow web server, um, this places a requirement on Apache to have continuous access to the TPM in order to service new clients, so in order to, to establish new TLS connections. Um, and the idea is that it makes it more difficult to duplicate the identity of the server um, without you know, continuous access to the one TPM holding the private key. Um, it can also provide a, uh, a single point of, 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 of disabling or revoking in, in the event that some security policy is violated on the system. So you can you know, shut down the TPM and then uh, no clients can connect to the server anymore. Um, and so depending on the value of the data going over the wire, this, you know, this performance trade-off might be useful to you. Although I'll, I'll admit there are definitely some diminishing returns involved as you, as you add more layers of security on top of things like you know, file system encryption. Uh, but nevertheless, it can make managing network identities easier in, in certain situations. And the TPM2 PKCS11 documentation also has uh, numerous readmeans on integrating this into various applications like SSH, VPN, uh, RADIUS, uh, Wi-Fi authentication, uh, and, and others. And I'll leave those uh, to you to explore. They all basically follow the same pattern, just, just with different tools. I mentioned earlier that TPMs are no magic bullet, and indeed no security technology really is. Uh, so in this section, let's explore how to break everything we just talked about, uh, and then talk about some ways to improve the aforementioned examples, uh, in some circumstances anyway. So the TCG specifies TPM's security model in, in terms of uh, API behaviors and some internal state. Uh, it doesn't really mandate any particular hardware security. That's largely left up to vendors and, and integrators putting these chips into, you know, onto boards or into CPUs. Uh, so one common attack point, particularly with discrete TPMs, is the bus. Uh, so they're usually connected to you know, relatively simple buses that can be decoded with cheap tools and therefore exploited with uh, man-in-the-middle style attacks. And indeed, you know, passwordless disk encryption schemes like the ones I, I, I described have been broken in offline attacks uh, before. For example, there are some pretty simple tools to sniff BitLocker's master key during power-up with a, a $50 FPGA board. Uh, and that project also includes software to decrypt the disk, plus uh, quite a pleasant video ex demonstrating how it all works in about 10 minutes. Um, and this can be you know, easily adapted to Linux as well. Uh, uh, the only difference really is just metadata. There are tools for older TPM 1.2 as well that can do exactly the same thing. Now, even with the shortcoming, TPM is not entirely useless. Uh, it makes transient attacks more difficult. So, for example, somebody with momentary access can't boot malware from USB to steal confidential data or manipulate something without notice. But somebody with prolonged access to your system will not be stopped by TPM, uh, perhaps d deterred at best. But we can improve this situation uh, with some trade-offs. So we can mitigate offline attacks by adding another authorization requirement uh, to releasing or using secrets uh, with, uh, within the TPM. So almost every layer of the object hierarchy can be configured with an access password, uh, including the hierarchy itself, that, that seed which derives you know, the primitives and objects underneath it. So to use any element of the hierarchy, the password needs to be supplied with the, with the creation command. Um, so we can amend the examples from before uh, 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 to include an externally supplied password, say, by the user. Uh, of course, you know, this is not very amenable to headless systems, but if there is a user or other device involved in these systems, this can you know, mitigate the, you know, many of the shortcomings we discussed earlier. So TPM also provides several ways to authenticate, to, to prove you have the password. Uh, uh, so the simplest method is to transmit it in the clear. So this is what's happening on the left with, with TPM tools. And this is vulnerable to uh, online man-in-the-middle attacks, so somebody monitoring the bus in real time as, as you enter your password. Uh, but there are more sophisticated options, too, that can prevent this as well. Uh, so, for example, the TPM will accept a nonced HMAC of the command messages that are keyed to the password um, instead of sending the password in the clear. And then it will also uh, reply with an HMAC you know, similarly keyed to the same password that was 
agreed upon earlier. So you can verify the TPM's, uh, TPM's response. So that basically the user and the TPM can use the scheme to mutually authenticate each other without sending the actual uh, uh, token across the wire. Um, there's an even more complicated uh, auth session approach, which can actually chain together multiple uh, you know, factors of authentication together to authorize something to happen. So you can connect you know, your fingerprint reader and your retinal scanner and, and whatever other, other security device you want into a complex policy uh, and to, 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 to authorize some action. Uh, you can also do you know, uh, encryption of in-flight data with, uh, with, with certain commands to, 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 to prevent eavesdropping on the bus. Um, and there are some limitations with this. Uh, but this is what, uh, what, what the PKCS11 library on the right is, is using. And I believe the Linux keyring uses the HMAC option. Now, one challenge with, uh, with multi-factor, uh, uh, particularly in the context of secure boot, is, is wh where do you enter the password? So if you can't trust the UI until you talk to the TPM, and you can't talk to the TPM until you enter the password, uh, where do you enter the password? Um, so you, know, you can do this from a second like trusted authentication device communicating through the system to the TPM. Um, that would work, but it's kind of clunky. Um, there's a, a human involved, though. There, uh, at least you know, one point during boot, uh, there is a software solution. So uh, TPM... Uh, TOTP is a, is a clever little tool that can generate those six-digit one-time password codes uh, inside the TPM uh, using a, a, an HMAC key authorized by a, a PCR policy. So you can use this, for example, to give the, the, you know, the, the human operator a, a, an opportunity to visually inspect the hardware for alterations and then using their phone, right, in, in inspect the software, uh, so to speak, before entering credentials to continue. Um, this also enables uh, you know, other security mechanisms that are sort of orthogonal to the TPM. So, for example, you can use the TPM to verify the you know, firmware and the, uh, in the init system uh, with a one-time password and then use a simple password for the file system, you know, completely orthogonal to the TPM uh, thereafter. Um, and so, you know, this is a great approach for, like, personal laptops. Obviously, a little more difficult on headless systems. Uh, it's also not without its own limitations. Uh, an attacker, for example, could pre-calculate uh, OTP values into the future uh, with one of the offline bus attacks and then present those fake values to a user as part of an online attack to get their, to get their password. Uh, it just, you know, it's just another layer that makes things more difficult. And this kind of brings me to my final thought. Um, you know, secrets inside the TPM are just blobs of data encrypted by keys derived from some seed stored on flash. Uh, underneath some plastic and silicone. And on many TPMs, this can be removed with a good laser or some potent acid. Um, and some manufacturers have decap countermeasures, but these aren't mandated uh, by the spec. And certainly no countermeasure is ever going to be perfect. Um, so if, if you break the root of trust on the TPM, you can then use that information to slowly break things above it, you know, whether it's fake OTP values or fake PCR measurements to do something else or, or something else. Um, and how hard this is to exploit largely depends on how well other security systems are designed around the TPM. Uh, you know, no, no security technology is perfect. Uh, the TPM's job is just to make the attack more costly in a relatively standard way that's easy or, easy or easier for us to implement than a homebrewed solution. Um, and I, I hope you can see some of these benefits uh, for your systems after uh, today's presentation. So once again, uh, thank you for attending, and uh, I will uh, yield the remainder of my time for your questions. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so this will be the Q&A portion of the session. Um, so uh, feel free to ask some questions in the uh, uh, Q&A window. Um, I see that um, uh, some of you already have, so I'll just, uh, I'll just go down the list kind of in order. Um, so uh, uh, Thomas asked uh, if, if there are any uh, uh, affordable CPMs available for uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, so the Infineon actually produces um, uh, uh, a few boards, like in the $50, $60 range you can connect to the Pi. There's also something similar for like Diva boards. Uh, they just plug into the, to the I.O. banks on, the, on those devices. Um, but I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll caution you with, uh, with those add-on TPM boards uh, on things like the, the, the Pi. Uh, they don't, you know, the, the firmware on the Raspberry Pi, for example, doesn't understand TPM and doesn't do uh, boot measuring. So if you're hoping to use that for whole disk encryption, it's, it's not really going to be that effective um, as, as, you know, as, as it were on, say, on a board with a TPM built in. Um, 
Uh, oh, and uh, someone also asked if there, there will be a video recording available. So uh, the the slides, the, my slide deck is already posted on the uh, uh, on the abstract uh, page, and the video will be available uh, after the show, um, as well as posted to YouTube, I think, in a few months. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, so someone asked uh, if, uh, considering bus attacks, uh, should a firmware TCM implementation that uh, relies on SOC integrated blocks be preferred to a discrete TCM? Uh, yes, uh, I mean, in, in, in certain cases. Uh, well, really, I should say there are some trade offs with it. Um, the, the trouble with firmware TCMs is, is oftentimes they, they rely on, uh, on, on uh, making memory uh, isolation. Um, so, like the Intel PTT runs in a memory enclave on the chip, and so uh, you know, it, it, it can be vulnerable to like the the, the Spectre class attack um, to, to extract secrets from it. Uh, but yeah, on, on on the flip side of it, there there are no leads that you can probe with a hardware attack. Um, the uh, AMD secure technology, I think, on some of their chips, that actually is a coprocessor embedded inside the SOC. So that that actually provides a little more security guarantee. You, know, you almost have like the benefit of a discrete TCM. Um, and uh, with, with that, without some limitations of, of it running with, you know, uh, within the CPU and memory. Um, so it, it, it sort of depends. Um, let's see, Thomas also mentioned that uh, uh, there's a, a, a Mando server is, is, is an example of uh, a user-free two-factor auth. Um, so I, I've never heard of that, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, certainly, a, you know, a, a legitimate strategy for headless systems with CPM is to have a remote system provide the, the authorization value to to release the you know the disk encryption key. Um, so yeah, that's definitely one way to go about it. Um, I'd say that you know the, the most common implementation is uh, um, uh, is, is either you know, user interactive or or just uh, kind of one factor. In these cases, like with the locker. Um, let's see. Oh, yes, and uh, somebody just responded. Uh, there's a link to a CPM for Raspberry Pi uh, from a company called Let's Trust. Okay, uh, well, if, if uh, uh, there are no more questions, uh, uh, you can feel free to email me um, uh, uh, after the show, uh, or I will also be on the uh, Linux uh, uh, track on Slack, uh, where we can chat afterwards. So, th thank you all for uh, uh, again for attending the session.